The Gulag Archipelago, Volume Two, Section One, continued. Cassette Six, Side Two. Fortunately, born outside the bounds of the archipelago, the Zex arrived here not altogether naked. They wore what they came in, more accurately, what the socially friendly elements might leave of it. Except that, as a brand of the archipelago, a piece had to be torn off, just as they clip one ear of the ram. Great coats have their flaps cut off diagonally. Budeni helmets have the high peak cut off, so as to leave a draught through the top. But alas, the clothing of free men is not eternal, and footgear can be in shreds in a week from the stumps and hummocks of the archipelago. And therefore, it is necessary to clothe the natives. Even though they have nothing with which to pay for the clothing, some day the Russian stage will yet see this sight, and the Russian cinema screen, the pea jackets one colour and their sleeves another, or so many patches on the pea jacket that its original cloth is totally invisible, or a flaming pea jacket with tatters on it like tongues of flame, or patches on breeches made from the wrappings of someone's food parcel from home. And for a long while to come, one can still read the address written in the corner with an indelible pencil. In Tsarist Akatui, the prisoners were given fur overcoats, and on their feet the tried and true Russian lapti, bast sandals, except that they had no decent onuchi footcloths to go with them. Or else they might have a piece of old automobile tire tied right on the bare foot with a wire, an electric cord, grief. Has its own uninventiveness, or else there were felt boots, burki, put together from pieces of old, torn-up, padded jackets, with soles made of a layer of thick felt and a layer of rubber. Neither Dostoevsky nor Chekhov nor Yakubovich tells us what the prisoners of their own Tsarist times wore on their feet, but of course they were doubtless shod; otherwise, they would have written about it. In the morning at the gatehouse. Hearing complaints about the cold, the chief of the camp would reply with his gulag sense of humour, "My goose out there goes around barefoot all winter long and doesn't complain, although it's true her feet are red, and all of you have got rubber overshoes." And then, in addition, bronze grey camp faces will appear on the screen, eyes oozing with tears, red eyelids, white cracked lips covered with sores. Skewbald, unshaven bristles on the faces. In winter, a summer cap with ear flaps sewn on. I recognise you. It is you, the inhabitants of my archipelago. But no matter how many hours there are in the working day, sooner or later, sloggers will return to the barracks. Their barracks. Sometimes it is a dugout dug into the ground, and in the north, more often, a tent. True, with earth banked and reinforced, hit or miss with boards. Often there are kerosene lamps in place of electricity, but sometimes there are the ancient Russian splinter lamps, or else cotton wool wicks. In Ostvim, for two years they saw no kerosene, and even in headquarters barracks they got light from oil from the food store. It is by this pitiful light that we will survey this ruined world. Sleeping shelves in two stories. Sleeping shelves in three stories, or as a sign of luxury, vagonki, multiple bunks, the boards most often bare and nothing at all on them. On some of the work parties, they steal so thoroughly and then sell the spoils through the free employees that nothing government issue is given out, and no one keeps anything of his own in the barracks. They take both their mess tins and their mugs to work with them, and even tote the bags containing their belongings. And thus laden, they dig in the earth. Those who have them put their blankets around their necks, a film scene, or else lug their things to trusty friends in a guarded barracks. During the day, the barracks are as empty as if uninhabited. At night, they might turn over their wet work clothes to be dried in the dryer, if there is a dryer. But undressed like that, you are going to freeze on the bare boards, and so they dry their clothes on themselves. At night, their caps may freeze to the wall of the tent, or, in a woman's case, her hair. 
They even hide their bast sandals under their heads, so they won't be stolen off their feet. Bure polom, during the war. In the middle of the barracks there is an oil drum with holes in it, which has been converted into a stove, and it is good when it gets red hot, then the steamy odor of drying footcloths permeates the entire barracks. But it sometimes happens that the wet firewood in it doesn't burn. Some of the barracks are so infested with insects that even four days' fumigation with burning sulfur doesn't help. And when in the summer the zecks go out to sleep on the ground in the camp compound, the bedbugs crawl after them and find them even there. And the zecks boil the lice off their underwear in their mess tins after dining from them. All this became possible only in the 20th century, and comparison here with the prison chroniclers of the past century is to no avail. They didn't write of anything like this. It is necessary to add to all this the picture of the way the brigade's bread is brought on a tray from the bread-cutting room into the mess hall under guard of the huskiest brigade members carrying staves. Otherwise, other prisoners will grab it, tear it apart, and run off with it. And the picture should also be added of the way food parcels from home are knocked out of the Zek's hands at the very moment they leave the parcel office and also the constant alarm whether the camp administration is going to take away the rest day. And why talk about the war if for a whole year before the war they had not had one day off on the Uchta State Farm, and no one in Carlag could remember any rest days from 1937 right through 1945. Then, on top of everything, one has to add the eternal impermanence of camp life, the fear of change, rumors about a prisoner transport, the prisoner transport itself, the hard labor of Dostoevsky's time knew no prisoner transport, and for ten or even twenty years people served out their term in one prison, and that was a totally different kind of life. Then some sort of dark and sudden shuffling of contingents, either a transfer in the interests of production, or a commissioning by a medical review board, or inventory of property, or sudden night searches that involve undressing and the tearing apart of all the prisoners' meagre rags. And then beyond that, the thorough individual searches before the big holidays of May the 1st and November 7th. The Christmas and Easter of hard labor in the past century knew nothing like this. And three times a month there were the fatal, ruinous baths. To avoid repetition, I will not write about them here, there is a detailed story investigation in Shalomov and a story by Dombrovsky. And later there was that constant clinging and for an intellectual torturing lack of privacy, the condition of not being an individual but a member of a brigade instead, and the necessity of acting for whole days and whole years, not as you yourself have decided, but as the brigade requires. And one must remember as well that everything that has been said refers to the established camp in operation for some time. But that camp had to be started at some time, and by someone. And by whom, if not by our unhappy brother Zex, of course. They came to a cold, snowy woods. They stretched wire on the trees. And whoever managed to survive until the first barracks knew those barracks would be for the guard anyway. In November 1941, near the station of Reshoti, Camp No. 1 of Kraslag was opened. Over a ten-year period, they increased to 17. They drove 250 soldiers there, removed from the army to strengthen it morally. They cut timber, they built log frames, but there was nothing to cover the roofs with, and so they lived with iron stoves beneath the sky. The bread brought them was frozen, and they chopped it up with an axe and gave it out in handfuls broken up, crushed up, crummy. Their other food was heavily salted humpback salmon. It burned their mouths, and they eased the burning with snow. When you remember the heroes of the War of the Fatherland, do not forget these. Now that is the way of life of my archipelago. Philosophers, psychologists, medical men, and writers could have observed in our camps as nowhere else, in detail and on a large scale, the special process of the narrowing of the intellectual and spiritual horizons of a human being, the reduction of the human being to an animal, and the process of dying alive. 
but the psychologists who got into our camps were for the most part not up to observing. They themselves had fallen into that very same stream that was dissolving the personality into feces and ash. Just as nothing that contains life can exist without getting rid of its wastes, so the archipelago could not keep swirling about without precipitating to the bottom its principal form of waste, the last leggers, and everything built by the archipelago had been squeezed out of the muscles of the last leggers before they became last leggers. And those who survived, who reproach the last leggers with being themselves to blame, must take upon themselves the disgrace of their own preserved lives. And among the surviving, the orthodox communists now write me lofty protests. How base are the thoughts and feelings of the heroes of your story, one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. Where are their anguished cogitations about the course of history? Everything is about bread rations and gruel, and yet there are sufferings much more unbearable than hunger. Oh, so there are. Oh, so there are indeed much more unbearable sufferings, such as sufferings of orthodox thought. You in your medical sections and your storerooms, you never knew hunger there, orthodox, loyalist, gentlemen. It has been known for centuries that hunger rules the world, and all your progressive doctrine is, incidentally, built on hunger, on the thesis that hungry people will inevitably revolt against the well-fed. Hunger rules every hungry human being, unless he has himself consciously decided to die. Hunger, which forces an honest person to reach out and steal, when the belly rumbles, conscience flees. Hunger, which compels the most unselfish person to look with envy into someone else's bowl, and to try painfully to estimate what weight of ration his neighbor is receiving. Hunger, which darkens the brain and refuses to allow it to be distracted by anything else at all, or to think about anything else at all, or to speak about anything else at all except food, food, and food. Hunger, from which it is impossible to escape even in dreams. Dreams are about food, and insomnia is over food. And soon, just insomnia. Hunger, after which one cannot even eat up. The man has by then turned into a one-way pipe, and everything emerges from him in exactly the same state in which it was swallowed. And this, too, the Russian cinema screen must see, how the last leggers, jealously watching their competitors out of the corners of their eyes, stand duty at the kitchen porch, waiting for them to bring out the slops in the dishwater. How they throw themselves on it and fight with one another, seeking a fish head, a bone, vegetable parings, and how one last legger dies, killed in that scrimmage, and how immediately afterward they wash off this waste and boil it and eat it, and inquisitive cameramen can continue with their shooting and show us how, in 1947, in Dolinka, Bessarabian peasant women who had been brought in from freedom hurled themselves with that very same intent on slops which the last leggers had already checked over. The screen will show bags of bones which are still joined together, lying under blankets at the hospital, dying almost without movement, and then being carried out. And on the whole, how simply a human being dies. He was speaking, and he fell silent. He was walking along the road, and he fell down. Shudder, and it's over. How, in camp at Unja and Nuksha, the fat-faced, socially friendly worker signer jerks a zek by the legs to get him out to line up, and he turns out to be dead, and the corpse falls on its head on the floor. Croaked! the scum, and he gaily gives him a kick for good measure. At those camps during the war there was no doctor's aid, not even an orderly, and as a result there were no sick, and anyone who pretended to be sick was taken out to the woods in his comrades' arms, and they also took a board and a rope along so they could drag the corpse back the more easily. At work they laid the sick person down next to the bonfire, and it was to the interest of both the Zex and the convoy to have him die the sooner. What the screen cannot catch will be described to us in slow, meticulous prose, which will distinguish between the nuances of the various paths to death, which are sometimes called scurvy, 
sometimes pellagra, sometimes alimentary dystrophy. For instance, if there is blood on your bread after you have taken a bite, that is scurvy. From then on, your teeth begin to fall out, your gums rot, ulcers appear on your legs, your flesh will begin to fall off in whole chunks, and you will begin to smell like a corpse. Your bloated legs collapse. They refuse to take such cases into the hospital, and they crawl on all fours around the camp compound. But if your face grows dark and your skin begins to peel and your entire organism is racked by diarrhoea, this is pellagra. It is necessary to halt the diarrhoea somehow, so they take three spoons of chalk a day. And they say that in this case, if you can get and eat a lot of herring, the food will begin to hold. But where are you going to get herring? The man grows weaker, weaker, and the bigger he is, the faster it goes. He has already become so weak that he cannot climb to the top bunks. He cannot step across a log in his path. He has to lift his leg with his two hands, or else crawl on all fours. The diarrhoea takes out of a man both strength and all interest in other people, in life, in himself. He grows deaf and stupid, and he loses all capacity to weep, even when he is being dragged along the ground behind a sledge. He is no longer afraid of death. He is wrapped in a submissive, rosy glow. He has crossed all boundaries and has forgotten the name of his wife, of his children, and finally his own name too. Sometimes the entire body of a man dying of starvation is covered with blue-black pimples like peas, with pus-filled heads smaller than a pinhead. His face, arms, legs, his trunk, even his scrotum. It is so painful he cannot be touched. The tiny boils come to a head and burst, and a thick worm-like string of pus is forced out of them. The man is rotting alive. If black astonished head lice are crawling on the face of your neighbour on the bunks, it is a sure sign of death. Fie! What naturalism! Why keep talking about all that? And that is what they usually say today, those who did not themselves suffer, who were themselves the executioners, or who have washed their hands of it, or who put on an innocent expression. Why remember all that? Why rake over old wounds? Their wounds. Lev Tolstoy had an answer for that, to Biryukov. What do you mean, why remember, if I've had a terrible illness and I've succeeded in recovering from it and been cleansed of it? I will always remember gladly. The only time I will refuse to remember is when I am still ill and have got worse, and when I wish to deceive myself. If we remember the old and look it straight in the face, then our new and present violence will also disclose itself. I want to conclude these pages about last leggers with NKG's story about the engineer Lev Nikolaevich Y. Indeed, this must, in view of the first name and patronymic, be in honour of Tolstoy. A last legger theoretician who found the last legger's pattern of existence to be the most convenient method of preserving his life. Here is how the engineer Y occupies himself in a remote corner of the camp compound on a hot Sunday. Something with a resemblance to a human being, sits in a declivity above a pit in which brown, peaty water has collected. Set out around the pit are sardine heads, fish bones, pieces of gristle, crusts of bread, lumps of cooked cereal, wet, washed potato peelings, and something in addition which it is difficult even to name. A tiny bonfire has been built on a piece of tin, and above it hangs a soot-blackened soldier's mess tin containing a broth. It seems to be ready. The last legger begins to dip out the dark slops from the mess tin with a wooden spoon and to wash down with them one after another the potato peelings, the gristle, then the sardine heads. He keeps chewing away very, very slowly and deliberately. It's the common misfortune of last legger to gulp things down hastily without chewing. His nose can hardly be seen in the midst of the dark grey wool that covers his neck his chin, his cheeks. His nose and his forehead are a waxy brown colour, and in places the skin is peeling. His eyes are teary and blink frequently. 
Noticing the approach of an outsider, the last legger quickly gathers up everything set out there, which he has not yet eaten, presses his mess tin to his chest, falls to the ground, and curls up in a ball like a hedgehog. And now he can be beaten, shoved, but he is firmly on the ground, he won't stir, and he won't give up his mess tin. N.K.G. speaks to him in a friendly voice, and the hedgehog uncurls a bit. He sees his visitor, does not intend to beat him or take away his mess tin. A conversation ensues. They are both engineers, N.G. a geologist, and Y. a chemist. And now Y. discloses to G. his own faith. Basing himself on his still-remembered formulas for the chemical composition of substances, he demonstrates that one can get everything nutritionally necessary from refuse. One merely has to overcome one's squeamishness and direct all one's efforts to extracting nourishment from this source. Notwithstanding the heat, Y is dressed in several layers of clothes, all dirty. And he had a basis for this too. Y had established experimentally that lice and fleas will not multiply in extremely dirty clothing, as though they themselves were squeamish. Therefore, he had even picked out for one of his undergarments a piece of wiping in the repair shop. Here was how he looked. He wore a Budeni helmet with a black candle stump in place of the spiked peak. The helmet was covered with scorch marks. In some places hay and in some places oakum adhered to the greasy elephant ears of the helmet. From his outer clothing, torn pieces and tatters stuck out like tongues on his back and sides. Patches and patches a layer of tar on one side. The cotton wool lining was hanging out in a fringe along the hem. Both outer sleeves were torn to the elbows, and when the last legger raised his arms, he looked like a bat shaking its wings. And on his feet were boat-like rubber overshoes glued together from red automobile tires. Why was he dressed so warmly? In the first place, the summer was short and the winter long, and it was necessary to keep everything he had for the winter, and where else could he keep it except on himself? In the second place, the principal reason he created by this means a soft and well-padded exterior, and thus did not feel pain when he was struck. He could be kicked and beaten with sticks without getting bruised. This was his one defense. All he had to do was be quick enough to see who was about to strike him, drop to the ground in time, pull his knees up to his stomach, thus covering it, press his head down to his chest and embrace it with his thickly padded arms. Then the only places they could hit him were padded. And so that no one should beat him for too long at a time, it was necessary quickly to give the person beating him a feeling of triumph. And to this end, Y had learned to howl hideously like a piglet from the very first blow, even though he wasn't hurting in the least. For in camp they are very fond of beating up the weak, not only the work assigners and the brigadiers, but the ordinary zecks as well, so as not to feel completely weak themselves. And what was to be done if people simply could not believe in their own strength unless they subjected others to cruelty? And to why this seemed a fully endurable and reasonably chosen way of life, and one, in addition, which did not require him to soil his conscience. He did nobody harm. He hoped to survive his term. The interview with the last legger is over. In our glorious fatherland, which was capable for more than a hundred years of not publishing the work of Chadayev because of his reactionary views, you see, you are not likely to surprise anyone with the fact that the most important and boldest books are never read by contemporaries, never exercise an influence on popular thought in good time. And thus it is that I am writing this book solely from a sense of obligation, because too many stories and recollections have accumulated in my hands, and I cannot allow them to perish. I do not expect to see it in print anywhere with my own eyes, and I have little hope that those who manage to drag their bones out of the archipelago will ever read it. And I do not at all believe that it will explain the truth of our history in time for anything to be corrected. In the very heat of working on this book, I was struck by the greatest shock of my life. The dragon emerged for one minute, licked up my novel with his wicked, rough red tongue and several other old works, and retired behind the curtain for the time. But I can hear his breathing, and I know that his teeth are aimed at my neck, that it is just that my time is not up yet. 
And with devastated soul, I am going to gather my strength to complete this investigation so that it at least may escape the dragon's teeth. In the days when Sholokov, who has long since ceased to be a writer, journeyed from this country of harried and arrested writers to receive a Nobel Prize, I was trying to duck the dicks, seeking a hiding place and trying to win time for my clandestine panting pen to complete this very book. I have digressed, but what I wanted to say was that in our country the best books remain unknown to their contemporaries, and it is very possible that I am therefore vainly repeating the secret work of someone else, when, had I known of it, I could have made my own work shorter. But during the seven years of our frail and pale freedom, some things did nevertheless emerge, despite everything, and one swimmer in the dawn-lit ocean has spied another head and cried out in a wheezy voice to him. And it was in this way that I learned of Shalamov's sixty camp stories and of his study of the thieves. I wanted to clear here that, apart from several individual points on which we disagree, no difference of interpretation has ever arisen between us in explaining the archipelago. He and I evaluate the whole native life in the same way. Shalamov's camp experience was more bitter and longer than mine, and I acknowledge with esteem that it fell to him rather than to me to plumb those depths of beastliness and despair to which the whole camp way of life was dragging us all down. This, however, does not prohibit my raising objections to specific points on which we disagree. One such point is the evaluation of the camp medical section. Shalamov speaks with hate and gall, and rightly too, of every camp establishment, but he always makes a biased exception solely for the medical section. He supports, if he does not create, a legend about the benign camp medical section. He affirms that everything in the camp was against the camp inmate except the doctor. He alone could help him. That he can help still doesn't mean that he does. He can help, if he so desires, just as the construction superintendent, the norm setter, the bookkeeper, the storeroom clerk, the cook, the orderly, and the work assigner can, too. But do many of them actually help? Perhaps up to 1932, when the camp medical sections were still subordinate to the People's Commissariat of Health, the doctors could still be doctors. But in 1932, the medical sections were turned over in toto to Gulag, and it became their goal to help the oppressors and to be grave diggers. So, leaving aside the good cases with good doctors, just who would have kept those medical sections in the archipelago at all if they had not served the common purpose? When the commandant and the brigadier beat up on a last legger because he refused to go out to work, so badly that he was left licking his wounds like a dog and lay unconscious for two days in a punishment cell, Babich, and for two months afterward could not even crawl down from the bunks, was it not the medical section, at camp number one of the Chida group of camps, that refused to draw up official certification of the beating and subsequently to treat him? And who was it, if not the medical section, that signed every decree for imprisonment in the punishment block? Incidentally, let us not lose sight of the fact that the chiefs did not have all that greater need for that doctor's signature. In the camp near the Indirgikar, S. A. Chebotaryov was a free plasterer, a medical assistant, this term being not by chance a piece of camp slang, too. He did not sign a single one of the camp chief's decrees for imprisonment in the punishment block, since he considered that even a dog shouldn't be put in such a punishment block, let alone people. The stove only warmed the jailer out in the corridor. That was all right. Incarcerations took place there without his signature. When, through the fault of the construction superintendent or the foreman, or because of the absence of fencing or safety precautions, a Zek died at work, who was it if not the medical assistant and the medical section that signed the certificate attesting that he had died of a heart attack. And what that meant was that everything could be left just as it was, and tomorrow others would die. Otherwise, the medical assistant would soon be working at the mine face himself, and the doctor, too. When quarterly commissioning took place, that comedy of general medical examination of the camp population with assignment to categories, TFT, heavy physical labor, SFT, average physical labor, LFT, light physical labor, and IFT, individual physical labor. 
Were there many good doctors who opposed the evil chief of the medical section, who was kept in his job only because he supplied columns for heavy labor? Or perhaps the medical section was at least merciful to those willing to sacrifice a part of their own bodies in order to save the rest. Everyone knows the law, not just in one camp or another. Self-mutilators, self-maimers, and self-incapacitators were refused all medical help. This was an administration order, but who actually refused the help? The doctors. Let's say you've blown off four of your fingers with a dynamite cap, and you've come to the infirmary. They give you no bandage. Drop dead, dog. And back at the Moscow Volga Canal during the wave of universal competition, for some reason, too many cases of self-maiming suddenly appeared, and there was an immediate explanation. This was a sally of the class enemy. And was one then to treat them? Of course, much depended here on the cleverness of the Zek who had maimed himself. It was possible to do it in such a way that it could not be proved. And Bernstein scalded his hand adroitly with boiling water poured through a cloth, and thus saved his life. Another might adroitly freeze his hand by not wearing a mitten, or else urinate in his felt boots and go out into the bitter cold. But you couldn't take everything into account. Gangrene could set in, and death would follow. Sometimes there were cases of unforeseen self-incapacitation. Babbage's unhealing scurvy ulcers were diagnosed as syphilis, and there was nowhere to make a blood test. He thereupon cheerfully lied that he and his entire family had syphilis. He was moved into the venereal disease zone of the camp, and by this means he postponed his death. Was there ever a time? When the medical section excused from work all the prisoners genuinely ill on a given day, or when it didn't drive a given number of seriously ill people out of the camp compound to work, Doctor Suleimanov refused to put Pyotr Kishkin, the hero and comedian of the Zek people, into the hospital because his diarrhea did not satisfy the norm. Every half hour, and it had to be bleeding. So, when the column formed up to go to the worksite. Kishkin sat down, running the risk of getting shot. But the convoy turned out to be more merciful than the doctor. They stopped a passing car and sent Kishkin to the hospital. People will object that the medical section was held to a strictly limited percentage of Group C, inpatients and ambulatory cases. Doctors got around that as best they could. In Sim Camp, they organized a semi-hospital. The last leggers lay there on their pea jackets and went out to shovel snow, but were fed from the hospital rations. The free chief of the medical department, A. M. Statnikov, got around the Group C quota in the following way: he cut back on the hospitals and the working compounds, but in turn expanded the hospital camps, that is, camps entirely for the sick. In the official Gulag documents, they sometimes even wrote, "Raise the physical fitness of the Zeks." But they refused to give any funds for this purpose. In fact, the very complexity of these subterfuges of honest physicians proves that the medical sections were not allowed to interfere with the death process. So there was an explanation in every case, but in every case there also remained a cruelty in no wise outweighed by the consideration that, on the other hand, they were doing good to someone else. And then we have to bring in here the horrible camp hospitals, like the one at Camp Number Two of Krivoschekovo, a small reception room, a toilet, and a hospital room. The toilet stank and filled the hospital air, but was that the worst of it? In each hospital cot lay two diarrhea patients, and others were lying on the floor between cots. Those who had grown weak evacuated in their cots. There were no linens or medicines. 1948 to 1949, the hospital was run by a third-year medical student, a 58 himself. He was desperate, but there was nothing he could do. The hospital orderlies, who were supposed to feed the patients, were strong, fat young fellows. They ate the patients' food, stealing from their hospital ration. Who had put them in their cushy spots? The godfather, no doubt. The student didn't have the strength to get rid of them. Or defend the patient's rations, but would any doctor have had it either? Dostoevsky entered the hospital without any hindrance, and the medical section in his prison was the same for both prisoners and convoy. What immaturity! 
Or could it possibly be contended that the medical section in every camp was able to insist on really human nutrition? Well, at least to the extent of not having those night-blind brigades returning from work in the evenings in a line of the night-blind clinging to one another? No. If by some miracle some intervention did secure an improvement in nutrition, it would only have been the work administration so as to have strong sloggers and certainly never the medical section. No one is blaming the physicians for all this, though their courage to resist was often weak because they were afraid of being sent to general work. But the legends about the saviors from the medical sections aren't needed either. Like every branch of the camp administration, the medical section too was born of the devil and filled with the devil's blood. Continuing his thought, Shalomov says that the prisoner in camp could count only on the medical section and that he could not count on the work of his own hands, that he did not dare. This led to the grave. In camp, it is not the small ration that kills, but the big one. The saying is true. The big ration is the one that kills. In one season of hauling timber, the strongest slogger would end up a hopeless last legger himself. At that point, he would be certified a temporary invalid, Fourteen ounces of bread and gruel from the bottom-ranking pot. During the winter, a number of such people died, well, say 725 out of 800. The rest of them went on to light physical work and died on that. So what other way out can we offer Ivan Denisovich if they are unwilling to take him on as a medical assistant or a hospital attendant and also won't fake him a release from work for even one day? If he is too short on schooling and too long on conscience, to get himself fixed up with a job as trustee in the camp compound. Is there any other course left him than to put his trust in his own two hands? What about the rest point, the OP? What about maiming himself? And what about early release on medical grounds, Aktirovka? Let Ivan Denisovich talk about them in his own words, for he has given them plenty of thought. He had the time. The rest point, the OP, that's like a camp rest home. Tens of years the Zeks bend their backs, don't get vacations, so they have rest points for two weeks. They feed much better there and they're not driven outside the camp compound to work. And in the compound they only put in three, four hours of real easy work, pounding rocks to pave roads, cleaning up the compound or making repairs. And if there were half a thousand people in the camp, they'd open a rest point for fifteen. And then, if everything had been divided up honestly, everyone would have gotten rest point once in just over a year. But just as there was no justice in anything in camp, there was especially none with rest points. They would open up a rest point sneakily, the way a dog snaps, and right off there would be lists ready for three whole shifts there. Then they would shut it down quick as a wink, too. It wouldn't last half a year. The types who pushed in would be the bookkeepers, barbers, shoemakers, tailors. The whole aristocracy, with just a few real sloggers thrown in for the look of the thing. The best workers, they said. And then the tailor, Berembliom, would shove under your nose. I made a fur coat for somebody outside, and a thousand rubles was paid the camp cashier for it. And you, idiot... All beams a whole month and the camp doesn't even get a hundred rubles for you. So who's the best worker? Who should get rest point? And so there you go around, your heart bleeding, trying to figure how to get into rest point just to catch your breath a little bit. And before you look around, it has already been shut down and that's the end of it. And the sorest point of all is that at least they could enter in your prison file that you had been at a rest point in such and such a year. It wasn't they didn't have enough bookkeepers in camp. No, they wouldn't because it was no good to them. The next year, they'd open up a rest point again, and again, their emblem would be in the first shift, and again, you'd be bypassed. In the course of ten years, they'd roll you sideways through ten camps, and in the tenth, you'd beg them just to let you poke your nose in the OP to see what it was like, whether the walls were painted decently, and so on, because, after all, you'd never been in one your whole term. But how could you prove it? No, no. No point in getting worked up about the rest points. But maiming yourself was another matter. To cripple yourself but still stay alive and become an invalid. As they say, one minute's endurance 
and a year of loafing. Break your leg and then stop the bone from knitting right. Drink salt water and swell up. And smoke tea, spoil your heart. Or drink stewed tobacco, good for wrecking the lungs. But you had to be careful not to overdo, hurting yourself so badly that you leapfrogged invalidism into the grave. And who knew just how far to go? In many ways, an invalid didn't have things too bad. He might be able to get himself a spot in the cookhouse or the bast sandal shop. But the main thing smart people were looking for in making themselves invalids was early release on health grounds, Aktyrovka. Except that Aktyrovka, especially in waves, was even harder than getting into rest points. They got together a commission, inspected the invalids, and for the very worst of them, wrote up an act, a certificate, from such and such a date because of state of health. So and so is classified as unsuited to serve out his term further, and we petition for his release. We only petition, and while this certificate proceeded upward to the higher ups and then back down again, you could cash in your chips. That happened often. After all, the higher ups were sly bastards. They released ahead of time on health grounds those who were going to kick the bucket in a month anyway. In O. Volkov's story, grandfathers. Those old men released for bad health were driven out of camp, but they had nowhere to go, and hung on right in the vicinity to die, without the bread ration and shelter they had in camp. And also the ones who could pay well. There was a confederate of Kalikman who had got away with half a million. She paid a hundred thousand, and went free. Not like us fools. There used to be a book going around the barracks, and the students read it aloud in their corner. In it, there was one fellow who got himself a million and didn't know what to do with his million under Soviet power. There wasn't supposed to be anything to buy, and you could die of starvation with it, with that million. We used to laugh, tell that bull to someone else. As for us, we've seen quite a few of those millionaires walk out of camp too. You can't buy God's health back for a million, but you can buy freedom and buy power and buy people too, lock, stock, and barrel. And there are. Oh, oh, oh! So many of those who have piled up millions out in freedom too. Only they just don't shout it from the housetops or wave their arms about when they have it. But for the fifty-eights, early release for health is a closed door. During all the time the camps have existed, they say that maybe three times for a month apiece, prisoners sentenced under Section Ten were released early for health, and then that door too was slammed shut. And no one will take money from them from the enemies of the people. If you did, you'd be putting your own head on the block in place of theirs. Yes, and they don't have any money. Those politicians. What do you mean, Ivan Denisitch? They don't have any. Well, all right, we don't have any. But there is one form of early release that no blue cap can take away from the prisoner. This release is death. And this is the most basic, the steadiest form of archipelago output there is, with no norms. From the fall of 1938 to February 1939, at one of the Ustvim camps, 385 out of 550 prisoners died. Certain work brigades, or Gurtsov, died off totally, including the brigadiers. In the autumn of 1941, Petrograd, the railroad camp. Had a listed population of fifty thousand prisoners, and in the spring of nineteen forty-two, ten thousand. During this period, not one prisoner transport was sent out of Petrolag anywhere. So where did the forty thousand prisoners go? I have written thousand here in italics. Why? Because I learned these figures accidentally from a Zek who had access to them. But you would not be able to get them for all camps in all periods, nor to total them up. In the central sector of Burepolom camp, in the barracks housing the last leggers, in February 1943, out of 50 people, there were never fewer than four deaths a night, and one night there were 12. This book is continued on cassette seven, side one.